ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear translators, dear interpreters, dear students, dear scholars. Uh, my name is Hamouda Salhi, and I am the director of the master's program in translation and interpreting at the University of Tunis, El Manar. And today, we are very delighted to be able to host another keynote lecture as part of a series of lectures, talks, and events on language, translation, culture, uh, entitled, the series is entitled, Encounters at the Shores of Translation. We have been very honored uh, in this uh, event, online event, to be uh, hosting and inviting so many prominent scholars in these areas. And we have been more delighted to have so many of the uh, guest speakers accepting our invitation, including prominent scholars in translation, intercultural studies, and linguistics, including Naum Chomsky. Naum Chomsky, unfortunately, cannot make it in this round, despite the fact that uh, our invitation has been accepted. So we are here. We are, going, uh, we are going to see and to check how to schedule the meeting in the second round. Um, <coughs> so here we are very delighted uh, today to, uh, uh, to I, am, I am personally very delighted to be facilitating this talk that he will be given by Professor Julian House and honored to be introducing this great guest speaker today. I am particularly grateful to, I would uh, say, Juliana. Yes, too. <laughs> and she insisted early on uh, that I call her uh, Juliana. Uh, why? For two reasons I'm going to mention uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment. I'm grateful to her because she has been fighting uh, off the uh, challenge of technology and the challenge of <laughs> Zoom in particular and could Thank make it <laughs> with the help of someone. And here I would like to, uh, I would like, uh, to uh, state the reasons for me calling her Juliana. She is a friend of mine and she has a very special connection to Tunisia. Her son-in-law is Tunisian. And she, uh, she is taking Tunisia as uh, almost a second home. And uh, the other thing is that she has great sympathy, I would say, and I'm quoting her, great sympathy for the Arab world and the Arabic language in particular. So, uh, all of these reasons and factors are laying the foundation for a more informal uh, encounter as part of the encounters at the shores of translation. Mm -hmm. It is personal. Uh, and knowledge can be laid down and shared in a very amicable and friendly environment more and i know this as in my capacity as a conference interpreter i have to know my audience to be their friends and allies to know them more so that i can have access to their personal space and when i access the personal space i can get the intentions better and to be more faithful to what they might be saying so professor julian house I think she's uh, uh, is uh, very well known uh, for the community of. Uh, can you please uh, mute your mics? This is my request because I cannot do it each time. Uh, Julian House is very no, no, well known uh, uh, among us, the community of intercultural studies 
the community of translation studies. She is a professor emerita uh, for, uh, Hamburg University. She's a distinguished university professor, Hellenic U American University, Athens, honorary visiting professor of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Budapest, or Budapest, and a Beijing University of Science and Technology, as well as a past president of the International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies. Her research interests include translation, contrastive pragmatics, discourse analysis, politeness, and English as a global language. She has published widely in uh, all these areas. Her latest, sorry, I have to mute the sounds. I'm sorry for... Her research interests include translation, contrastive pragmatics, discourse analysis, politeness, and English as a global language. She has published widely in all these areas. Her latest books include translation as communication across languages and cultures. And I have uh, a, a copy of it, uh, 2000, uh, published in 2016, and translation, the basics, published in 2017. So this is our guest speaker uh, of today, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to this uh, uh, exchange. It is an informal exchange and uh, the format will be uh, as follows. Uh, uh, I will be uh, giving the floor to uh, Juliana to speak for uh, 40 or 45 minutes. Uh, then I will be glad to ask one question and then uh, I will be pleased to host a question and answer session later on and I would like to uh, uh, remind you of uh, housekeeping announcements in a way, like uh, Juliana has said earlier. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please raise that blue uh, hand. And I will be taking the participants by the order by, uh, as they appear uh, on the screen. Uh, and the other thing is that... Uh, uh, Juliana has kindly accepted to extend the uh, time or the duration uh, if there is interest and uh, many requests of the floor. So without further ado, I hand it over to you, Juliana. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. Okay. Right. Anyway, thank you very much for introducing me and for saying such nice uh, words about me. I hope uh, uh, I deserve this uh, compliment and the positive mention. And without any further ado, I will now start my presentation. Okay. Uh, can you see the presentation, the participants? Okay. Hello. Yes, we yes, can. we can soothe. Yes, you, can, you, can. You, you. you can. You can both hear me and see it, okay? Exactly. See you, hear okay. you, and see Very the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So, the, the, the title of my talk, uh, as Hamuda just said, is Translation as Intercultural Communication. No? This is the first thing. And it doesn't, Freigabe, why doesn't it work? It, it doesn't Can you use the, the arrows? To no, I can't. It, it doesn't work. It's it's neue Freigabe. Why don't I Freigabe unter? Nee. Ah. PowerPoint presentation. Okay, I can't. I, it doesn't move. But I did. It it did before. Why doesn't it move now? Can Can you stop it's sharing different. and then share it again? Let's do it again. Yes. Okay, now I do the Bildschirm freigeben, but this is a German. Yeah. I, I click it, and then I can see the... Okay, but this is not the PowerPoint yes, now presentation. I think it works now. Can you? Yeah, but is, is, is this is not the PowerPoint presentation. Um, doch, it does. It, you're right. It is, it is. No, 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 it's... it's uh. Yeah. Now, now it works. Okay. Now it works. So Good. the structure of my talk is as follows. 
I will first deal with the topic translation and intercultural communication, what they are, in other words, defining it and how the two concepts are related. Secondly, I will theorize translation as an act of communication between languages and cultures. And thirdly, I will talk about globalization and translation as intercultural communication. Okay, so what do I mean or what do we mean by translation? Translation is both a social activity and a cognitive process. Translation facilitates communication between people who do not have or do not choose to use a common language. I put here do not choose to use because two people when they interact, they may well be competent in the two languages, but let's say for diplomatic reasons, they are only supposed to speak their mother tongue. When, when uh, Angela Merkel, for instance, meets Putin, the Russian uh, president, they both know Russian and German, but each only speaks uh, his or her own language, okay? Now, we have to uh, make a mental note that translation is never a primary event. It is always a secondary communicative event. Normally, a communicative event occurs once, like what we're doing now. Translation, however, reduplicates it for people otherwise prevented from appreciating the original event. Translation and intercultural communication. Translation fulfills an important service in overcoming lingua cultural barriers. We can say that translation actually is intercultural communication between members of different lingua cultures with their often diverging knowledge sets, values, beliefs, histories, traditions, social and regional backgrounds. What is intercultural communication? It's communication between members of different lingua cultures following different sociocultural behavioral rules that are determined by the histories, traditions, legal systems, social class, region, age, gender, biographies, experience, attitudes, motivation, etc. In other words, a very complex thing. Now, let me give you a, a review of literature uh, about intercultural communication. It's a very popular area. And I now will present you, uh, to you what I have styled old thinking about intercultural communication. I will be very critical about this. This old thinking is based on essentialist generalizations that links culture with race, nation, region, and religion. The outcome of this are cultural stereotypes, mentalities, and the relatively ludicrous idea of a national character. That goes back to uh, the, the previous century, where after the Second World War, the victory nations, particularly the United States, wanted to understand why the German uh, the, the Germans behaved as they did. And there is a lot of the literature on the national character of the Germans. The roots of this old thinking on intercultural communication are in colonization, the military, diplomat diplomacy, global business, missionizing, and so-called peace research, as we will hear later, what is called peace research is anything but peace research. And there are several well-known scholars who propagated these ideas. In all of what I call the old thinking about intercultural communication, real sociocultural diversity, complexity, hybridity, and individuality is systematically ignored. One uh, important uh, example of this old thinking is, and many of you will know this, Gerd Hofstede's four dimensions of culture that he called power distance, tolerance of uncertainty, 
individualism versus collectivism, masculinity versus femininity. Just one example, the entire nations, probably uh, many uh, Arabic speaking countries are used to be collectivist and not uh, in individual, right? The, the, the West or the so-called West are usually called individualism focused uh, nations, right? Now, this research builds uh, characteristics of entire cultures, uh, was built on the basis of questionnaires distributed many years ago to IBM employees in 40 different countries. Another example is the peace, Norwegian peace um, researcher Johan Galtung, who talked about different intellectual styles, Saxonic, Nipponic, styles, that entire cultures are supposed to share. Saxonic, Anglo-Saxon, Nipponic, East Asian, Gallic, probably you belong to Gallic as a former French colony, Teutonic, that's me, and the Netherlands, etc. Again, you can see how ridiculous this is. Edward T. Hall is a bit more serious, somewhat an ethnographer. He divided cultures according to their locations on time and space. He distinguished between so-called monochronic and polychronic cultures. In other words, monochronic, when people do one thing after another, polychronic cultures are full of people who do several things at the same time. High versus low context, people relying a lot on the context versus not relying, and the speed of information distribution. Another uh, 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 distinction that can be made uh, by the German psychologist Alexander Thomas, very successful in, in, in many cultures, he set up so-called cultural standards, distinguishing them versus interpersonal distance versus proximity. Very simply put, there are certain cultures where people constantly kiss one another or hug or whatever. That was before Corona, of course, I may insert. Rule orientation versus improvisation and a focus on authority versus egalitarian. Again, they are very, very similar to other uh, such models, okay? Another one, this is my favorite, Samuel Huntingdon, who very famously uh, divided the cultural world into the West versus the rest. You in Tunisia are probably belong to the rest, you will be pleased to hear. And this work, very racist type of work, is also full of uh, the superiority of the advanced democratic West versus the, in quote, backwards and autocratic Islamic countries. You have to read this. It's very, very dangerous. I used it in my teaching at the University of, of Hamburg and uh, students were shocked uh, to read it. Okay. All of these, uh, uh, all of these approaches actually foster prejudice because they make very, very useful generalizations, okay? And the, 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 this type of research is also the basis of many lucrative so-called intercultural training programs that live off and perpetuate such dangerous cliches, okay? Lots of management training courses actually are full of such uh, rubbish, I'm sorry to say this, okay? Now, intercultural communication cliches are profitably and today more than ever instrumentalized for the global economy and also for legitimizing military, so-called humanitarian anti-terror interventions. Okay? There is also in the literature in intercultural communication, a, to my mind, dangerous selection of so-called hot spots or critical incidents that again invite and cement stereotype of people in other cultures, okay? Intercultural com communication is here always very simplified and instrumentalized for the expansion of neoliberal capitalism, global business, also tourism, of course, big industry, and military humanitarian intervention in the name of peace, security, 
and understanding should all be in inverted commas because it does the opposite. In all of these approaches, we find a trivialization and marginalization of language, a focus, decided focus on how different people are, how their mentalities are different. They also focus on, on relatively superficial behavioral etiquette, whether people eat with a spoon or with a knife or with chopsticks or whatever, very trivial, okay? Now, summary of this old thinking, again, embodying cliches and stereotypes, roots in colonization, wars, religious missionizing, Christian crusades, real sociocultural diversity, complexity, hybridity, individuality, and built-in change, cultures always change, are deliberately ignored to be better commercially exploited, for instance, in intercultural trainings for very big money. It's a lot of money. Big firms always employ this very dubious type of research. Now, new thinking about intercultural um, communication. Here we have a view of culture as diversified, as dynamic, fluid, hybrid, ever-changing, new things are emer emerging with different generations, right? Today, the boundaries in our globalized world are, of course, increasingly blurred and negotiable. We cannot even say this is one particular lingua culture and this is the next. Cultures are interconnected in interaction and exchange not least due to translation. There are other concepts than culture. For instance, the concept of small cultures or communities of practice, or recently people speak of transient intercultural groups. What we are doing now is a transient intercultural groups. We come together for the event and then we disperse, but we are sharing a particular culture at the moment, right? Now, intercultural communication can be seen, as Ingrid Piller uh, in, from Australia sees it, as social practice in motion. And we have always to ask whether culture in a particular event is really relevant. We have to ask who makes culture relevant, to whom, for which purpose, in which context. This context, for instance, it means you are from a different lingua culture than me, right? But at the moment, this is irrelevant, whether you are in Tunisia and I am in Germany, totally irrelevant. Culture in this particular event is not relevant, right? The, we have to look at the discursive construction of intercultural communication in a particular context, like the context we now share, okay? We need, for this, we need, qualitative dispersal, ethnographic and contextual analysis, and not falling into the trap of generalizing entire cultures uh, uh, over time. Okay, now I'm talking on set, namely intercultural understanding. In the past, intercultural communication uh, research focused on failure, on culture shock, people who uh, move into another culture we're supposed to have culture shock I don't know I never had culture shock uh, at all but people blow this up the, the famous civilization clashes of Huntingdon Anomi Elin and misunderstanding a lot of research was involved in this as well we have a, vo a volume on misunderstanding uh, in social life recently however there is to not understand, to examine how interactants manage understanding in certain communities of practice, okay? Now, intercultural understanding, a very important concept, this is, is also the basis of a crucial concept in translation, namely functional equivalence. Functional equivalence is a condition for intercultural understanding. We can define it as the success with which intercultural communication is made to function 
through the provision of common ground. Common ground, very important concept in, in cognitive linguistics, for instance, by Herb Clark already in 1996. You need a bit of common ground to be able to understand one another. That makes sense, right? Now, uh, what, why, why is this barter room? I don't want the barter room. Okay. Translation as intercultural communication. The link between functional equivalence, the conceptual basis of translation, and intercultural understanding, the basis of intercultural communication, is highlighted in the discipline of functional pragmatics via the concept of the dilated speech situation. Now, again, it doesn't work. Hello. Why is it stuck again? I'm hitting you. No, it goes. Okay. The dilated speech situation is the following. Texts as agents of the transmission of a message from a writer to a reader when both are not at the same place at the same time. That is actually the nature of written language as we know. The writer may have died centuries ago and we are reading it now. So they are separate through a place and time. Through such a transmission of a text by a text, the original situation becomes dilated. What we're having here is not a dilated speech situation, right? Now, translation is more complex. In translation, we not only find a dilated, but also a ruptured, a broken speech situation. The rupture or brokenness of the original speech situation is due to the lingua cultural barrier between author and reader. The author, different language from the reader. Now, this rupture is bridged in translational action. And it is this rupture mending by the translator that makes translation necessarily a highly reflective action. The translator has to think a lot in order to do his task, right? The inherently reflective nature of translation reveals itself in a translator's focused on the situatedness of a text and the connection between text and context. I've done an article way back in uh, 2006 on text and context in translation in the Journal of Pragmatics, which uh, I can recommend uh, to you. Ideally, translation in translation also heightens sensitivity to ethical questions. You know, there's a lot of literature on the role of ethics in translation. Now, text and context in translation. Jan Blommert, a good friend of mine, wrote, Exploring a text in context is the only way of exploring text. As we know, even the meaning of a single word can only be resolved if we relate it, relate it to a certain context in which it appears. As texts travel across time, space, and different orders of indexicality in translation, they are recontextualized. In other words, texts in one language, when they move to another language, need to be recontextualized. To describe and explain the trajectory of texts, we need a theory of translation as intercultural communication and recontextualization. Now, and this, of course, is uh, my own theory starting in 1977, 1997, 2009, and 2015. And I give you a brief synopsis of the theory behind. Translation is always doubly contextually bound to its original and to the new recipient's communicative conditions. This double linkage, back and forth, is the basis of the equivalence relation. And to my mind, the equivalence relation is the conceptual heart of translation. Okay? 
since appropriate use of language in communicative performance is most important in translation, it is functional pragmatic equivalence that is crucial. This type of equivalence underpins the theory of translation as intercultural communication. Okay. Again, if something pops up here. The theory explicates how semantic, pragmatic, and textual meanings are reconstituted in different contexts to facilitate intercultural understanding. Right. I'm, I'm, it's always locked, you know. Okay. In translation, a text in one language is replaced by a semantically and pragmatically equivalent text in another language. An adequate translation is then a pragmatically and semantically equivalent one. Now, a first requirement for this equivalent is that a translation have a function equivalent to its original. There we are hacked now, excuse me. I see that there are lines coming on your... Yes, uh, I, I see the lines on the left. Yeah. The text has always two components, which in Hallidayian systemic functional linguistics are called ideational and interpersonal. Basically, language always has two functions, one being to uh, convey content from one person to another one, and two, to a social function, to interlock two peoples. Yeah, it's, it's both a content and a social uh, function. Okay? So, the function of a text I define as it's ap the application of a text in a particular cultural context. Very simple. Now, the relationship between the cultural context and the functional orga organization of language in text is revealed by breaking down the big context, the big concept of context into what has been called contextual parameters or contextual dimensions. Okay? To, to understand a text's meaning, it is linked to who is Shaib Malik, is in den Warteraum. Is Shaib Malik, is this the hacker? Malik? Uh, ich weiß es nicht, vielleicht. Malik? Malik Shaib. He's, he's, he's in, the, in the waiting room, I see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 I'm oh, sorry. Okay, you know. Uh, in other words, if we want to understand the meaning, we need to link it to the context of situation and the cultural context enveloping it. Such a view of function and context text relies the analytic framework of a theory of translation as intercultural communication. Okay, now, crucial in this theory is whether and how the function of a text can be kept equivalent. And this, in my view, depends on the nature of the translation sought. And I distinguish between two basic types of translation that I have called overt and covert translation. They are the outcome of different types of intercultural communication. Overt translation is more complex, covert more straightforward. And I explain what I mean by this. There's a lot of literature. Oh, no, the, the lines are, are there, but the hacker doesn't go do anything else. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe he comes. <laughs> anyway, in overt translation, the recipients are quite overtly not directly addressed. Classic example is speech. A speech given by a famous, let's say, a president of a state, whatever. Um, when you translate that speech, you cannot um, change anything. And the reader of the speech in another language know exactly that they are not meant. Yeah? They, and, and they are not directly addressed. Everybody knows it's a translation. It's not a second original. It's embedded in a new context, but still signals its foreign origin. The translator's work is visible. Translation is like a quote. Okay? It only enables the members of the new culture to judge the original's impact from outside. Here we can say true cultural transfer takes place 
because the readers of the translation are view a text as it was in its original shape, just with the language switched, okay? But here we can only have a second level functional equivalence, okay? This, the source text cultural context is co-activated. That's why I have called it psycholinguistically complex. When you read that speech, let's say by uh, uh, President Trump, who gives it obviously in American English, you read it in Arabic, translated, you uh, at the same time mentally envisage Trump with his beautiful hair, etc., speaking in American English, but you read it in your own language. So it's psycholinguistically complex. Now, Korva translation is the exact op opposite. These are texts that are not do not have a particular value, let's say advertisements, etc., that enjoy the status of an original in a new context. It's not marked pragmatically as a translation. It's a case of a language in use. These texts are of equal concern for members of the old and the new culture. We have here the case of a recreation of equivalent speech events and the original text function is um, uh, reproduced. There is no co-activation of the original context, no cultural transfer, um, psycholinguistically simple. The translator's task is to move away, to hide, to hide behind his acts of crossing and transform the original. The goal is true functional equivalence. This is possible in these texts. There's often massive adaptation by the translator and the translator makes allowance for the new context by employing what I have called a cultural filter, right? Now, the cultural filter is just a construct that captures the difference between communicative norms that are empirically established as holding in different cultures. Cultural filtering is ideally based on empirical, fine-grained cross-linguistic research to complement the translator's uh, choices. Okay. Here, an, an example, uh, for many, many years, 30 or 40 years, I did, a re did research on differences between German and English communicative norms to explain the changes necessary in covert translation. What I found is that German texts are often more explicit, they're more direct, they focus on the content, and they rely less on verbal routines. This, these are not the generalizations that I, I, I put down as old thinking, but they are based on, on uh, uh, discourse uh, research. Okay, now here is an example of a, who is Hamza Mohammed? Is he still there? Uh, no, 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 this is waiting room, and then I will uh, uh, delete her. Sh shall I? I, I, I yeah, continue, shall just I? continue, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the English text reads something like, Suppose you are a doctor in an emergency room and a patient tells you, etc. Can you, in other words, the reader in this text is addressed as you to put himself into the shoes of this doctor. Now, the back translation from German is interesting, following the cultural filter that the translators followed. Here we do not have this you, which would be do in German. The whole uh, text is in the third person, okay? For instance, can you, in fact, do anything? Um, can the doctor? So the text is completely changed because of the cultural filtering that takes account of the, uh, the way German readers would like to, uh, to, to read the translation. Similarly, here we have another uh, text, given the uncertain effectiveness of PEP, we physicians want to be sure that the treatment does not pose risks to our patients. We know, we know, etc. In the back translation, again, we do not find this first person plural. Rather, we again find the doctors, passive voice, impersonal, etc. Again, culturally filtered uh, uh, text. Okay? Cultural filtering has also been called localization. There's a person called Kavla Talbi. Is Kavla this known? Talbi. 
Yeah. Yes. Is yes. She uh, uh, yes. She is. Good. She's a student. Yes. Very, very good. Okay. No, again. Why don't I? Abir, can you check her, please, just to ask her to turn her camera in private, please? Thank you. Okay, I cannot. I cannot. I can, um, my 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 screen is locked. This has also never happened again. What, what happened? Yeah. And okay, cultural filtering today is often called localization. In today's global economy, there's a global de a growing demand for translations in the localization industries and in advertising, engineering, testing software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of this involves what a long time ago I have called cultural filtering to adapt the text to the needs of the new audience, right? Globalization, English as a lingua franca, and translation as intercultural communication. What we're doing here is we all use English as a lingua franca, right? We're all non-native speakers. So sure, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, Haula. Okay. She just message me. Thank you, yes. yes. Very good. So today we have a rising demand for covertly translated localized text simultaneously meant for many different recipients in many different lingua cultures. Now, due to globalization processes and the dominance of English and the increase of translations from English into other languages, cultural filtering may now become outdated, extinct and give way to cultural neutralism or universalism. But this cultural neutralism or universalism is really a drift towards Anglophone discourse norms. In other words, the idea here is that we all speak different languages, also through translation, but basically the norms of what we're doing, facilitated maybe through Zoom or Teams, etc., are actually Anglophone, right? Now, can we say that translation-induced cultural filtering is no longer with us? The, the influence of global English on the words, on the lexis in other languages, Anglicisms in other words, are well documented. However, the impact on the makeup of the discourse in other languages is still under-researched. One of the research is a project that I directed in the, uh, in the context of German Science Foundation's uh, research center on multilingualism. The project was called Covert Translation. Here we collected a diachronic corpus of science and business source texts. Their translations into To German, French, to the reverse translation distinction. There's a lot of uh, publications out of this. What we found, we did a quantitative, qualitative, diachronic corpus analysis, the changes of German communicative norms happened in the areas of subjectivity. Remember, the I or the U is, is, will, is now possible. Address the orientation, personal diaxis, connectivity, and modality. There is nowadays a tendency towards greater personalization, colloquialization, oralization, which is a characteristic, characteristic of Anglophone norms. We can now see this in German, but interestingly, not in French, not in Spanish, because as you know, particularly in the French language with the Académie Française, etc., they uh, actually do not want other languages to influence their precious uh, language. Okay. However, is it the fault of translation that ang anglophone influence uh, is taking place? Th there is no monocausality, and at least we have three possible explanations. The first one I called the boo factor, namely translation is, translation from English that is, is the mediator of the English takeover. In other words, translation effects change. However, there is a second possibility that I have called the X factor, the universal impact of globalization. Translation is not really the cause of this, the instigator. Translation merely reflects the change. The third one I have called the green factor. Since translators are highly trained 
um, uh, conservers of the language into which they are translating, we can say that translation may also resist the change. Okay. Now, um, translation as intercultural communication is well and alive in over translation, in my terms, where the cultural specificities continue to be maintained in certain genres. For covert translation, with its massive unilateral translation from English into other languages, the future is less clear. And now I want to give you, um, excuse the immodesty, uh, all the references that I um, mentioned during this talk, you can find in um, my latest books, okay, which that you can, uh, particularly interesting is the latest translation, the basics, basically where the, my theory is presented again, etc. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm sorry about the hacker that, um, yeah, interrupted us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juliana, now, for I, I, this I stopped, informative. I, I yes, stopped please here. stop <laughs> the okay. sharing of the screen. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, and I am uh, glad now to host a, a question and answer a session with uh, uh, our guest speaker. So okay. can you uh, uh, start raising your hands uh, to ask questions or make comments? I can see Eamon Tarhouni. You have the floor, please. Um, hello, and thank you, Professor, for uh, this presentation. It was very enriching. Um, I just got one question uh, about the, the three factors that you mentioned. And um, what's the difference between, I mean, how, how can the translation reflect and at the same time resist change? Um, the, the, Thank the, you. The, it's not at the same time. If the translation reflects the change, then particularly at the discourse level, you, you, you see that, for instance, conventions as mentioning the author as I or the addressee as you, etc. When this is, <coughs> excuse me, when this is changed, actually that reflects already the, that anglophone norms. <coughs> excuse me, I've spoke so long, I have to have yeah, a sorry. drink. Yeah. Okay, that again, again, we see that the norms of the of the receiving language are already sort of anglo 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 anglophile. anglophile okay, there's a, there's a an, an impact of the English language on the traditions in the the, the the translated texts. That happens a lot in 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 Germany. We analyzed this. We had a corpus of over a million words. We saw that, but uh, as I said, in French, this 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 didn't happen. Okay. So that reflects the changes already through English. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Abir. Abir. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Khudro is the, the first. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Dr. Khudro, you have the floor. Yes. Then uh, I have. I have. I have. Uh, uh, thank you very much indeed. I mean, you've covered quite a lot about uh, cultural filtering and uh, mm -hmm. uh, localization. It's, it's quite a lot of. Uh, uh, topics to discuss, but um, my concern is, um, I mean, you're talking about equivalence and being the main um, main focus, and that a true functional equivalence is is what you are um, your focus is. Yeah. The problem is uh, that all agencies is all translation agencies. I mean, I, I do understand what you're saying when we are looking at translation and say, yeah, we want the true functional. Equivalence. We want the contextual, uh, contextualized yeah. translation, recontextualized in another uh, culture, and yeah. so on. And mm -hmm. we don't want the anglophone uh, influence. Uh, please yeah. put it away. <laughs> Gambia uh, is one of these who doesn't hate anglicism. There. Yeah. But the problem is that if my question is now: the agencies, translation agencies. Yeah. They do not uh, accept, I mean, if I am to go and translate, I remember one of my colleagues was saying that he applied for, um, in Australia, they have a test for um, uh, translators to approve them, and they, he, he failed in that test, uh, basically because he, he, ha he uses 
the ideational, um, uh, the, uh, the functional equivalence, and um, they, they want a literal, um, uh, the formal translation. The problem is that this is quite a, a massive, massive problem uh, with regards to all those who apply for translation. Uh, yeah, tests. I know, I know. These are the constraints. The constraints. I mean, I do understand. Yes, it is a huge. I mean, the problem is I accept 100% what you are saying about the functional, but I think Farhati, I think I've seen her earlier in it, that she will not She's agree here. on the functional, functional um, uh, equivalence to ones. I do agree with you about the functional because I do audiovisual, and it actually requires you to use the functional more, the covert times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So how can we solve this problem? Uh, it's, it's a huge dilemma here. I would not be accepted as a translator. What, what can we do? Uh, the, it's a, a very difficult. I mean, I'm a I'm a theoretician. I had well said, but I <laughs> and I I, I think I, I don't know whether I I told my friend Hamura this. The translation is in interpreter in particular very very complex. That's why I basically fled the constraints and, and work as a researcher. You're much freer, right? And in general, a translator is is doubly uh, dependent. The translation is, uh, remember, it's a secondary thing. Something is already there, and you're bound by that thing. If you want to be, and that's really nasty to say to translators, if you want to be really original, you have to write your own texts. Yes. As a translator, yeah, as a translator you're dependent, you're doubly dependent. You're dependent on the text, and you're dependent, if you're, if you're working for an agency, by the bosses who give you the orders. That's just the way it is. In, in other words, the way out would be to own your own agency. Then you but, can set the standards. Yeah, exactly. But you see, I mean, I, I think I think the functional functional equivalence is absolutely yes. the right way forward. I hundred percent agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you get orders not to do it, you you have to do. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you, know, you have to follow this. I mean, in advertising they go for functional. And absolutely I, I, yes. I, you know, I mean, functional is the best one uh, in that. I know yeah. perhaps you will not uh, uh, be uh, favoring this, but I don't know what she thinks on this. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. Ab absolutely. It's absolutely. it's it's a it's a dilemma. I I recognize this, but I cannot uh, as a as a as a researcher, I cannot solve it somehow. Yes. <laughs> Juliana, may I ask you just to uh, uh, get the camera down a little bit so that we can see? Yes, so? Yeah, excellent. So, uh, yes, okay. I, I tend to, when I'm Thank excited, I, I bend it down. But I'm so happy that we're no longer hacked. Yes, good. Ah, thanks, guys. Uh, uh, so I have a question before I uh, go uh, again to the participants uh, mm -hmm. about uh, text and context. And uh, yes. when we translate, we need to explore the text in. In, in, in context. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, globalization and the new digital age, they brought with them a new character of the text and also the context in the sense that they made that shift from the greater solidity of things, including the text, into mm -hmm. uh, liquidity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, texts and contexts have become very liquid. They only live on, on, on the internet most of the time, and they, they are not solid in this sense. So how, what are the challenges now posed now on the translator to understand a text in a liquid state mm -hmm. and a context mm -hmm. that is dynamic and changing all the time. Yes. Uh, and, and can you relate this to the dilated, ruptured, or broken uh, speech situation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in, the, in this article that I can recommend you, which has been quoted very, very frequently, in 2006, Text and Context in Translation, Journal of Pragmatics, right? 2006, you look at it, you can probably get it for free now because it's 2006, I actually made already then, but that was before the internet, etc. what was so very, very important, the point that still holds, I think, that for translation, or interpreting even, you have to somehow make a cut. 
at a time. You cannot say everything changes. It's, it's emerging. It's all of this, what I, what I mentioned with respect to the, the new trend in intercultural communication. Remember? It's, just, it's fluid, etc. You This is impossible for translators. You have to make it at one particular point and you have to determine that. It's impossible to do that because you, you have to translate, right? You have to, and for the context, in, in my model of translation quality assessment that I didn't talk about today, we can have it at, at another session, um, I break down the context into so-called contextual parameters. And they still hold even with the fluidity. Very, very simply, it's always, there's always an author, somehow some author or somebody who writes the text that needs to be determined. There are always sort of envisaged addresses. You can also do this, right? There's always something that, 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 that I call the interpersonal relation, the role relationship. How, how is, is, the, is the author expert or not? You can determine this. There's what I call mode. Another thing, is this written or spoken? Or is it in between? Okay? All of this can be determined. But the, the main point is, unlike this fluidity, whatever it is, you're quite right. And I stressed it as well in what I called the new. You have to make a cut and say, this is it now, when I translate, it's no longer emergent, particularly not in interpreting so much, uh, where you can, uh, particularly in consecutive in interpreting, but in translation, you have to make a distinct, now I'm, this is it for me, I make a cut, this is the context, okay? Yeah. Otherwise, it's not possible, even if everything is fluid. Thank you. Yeah. This may be a disappointing. Uh, no, 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 no. It is. It is. Uh, but it, it, not it, disappointing well, at once all. again, if you if you don't know the paper, it's really very good. It gives all sorts of theories about context. I will, I will check it, yes. It's not so much. It's not so much about. Um, it is about translation, but it's also about linguistics and pragmatics, etc. I can to the students. It's it's a very very good um, uh, 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 paper. It's quoted yes. like hell. Still, two thousand six text and context. Thank you. Which is the basis of, of this of this thing. Okay. Yes, good. May I remind you of the camera again to adjust the camera? Oh, sorry. And let's yes. go to it's Professor Najat Mshala <laughs> and then Dr. Mohamed Zagoud. Dr. Najat okay. Mshala, please. Yes. Ah, Where is can Yes, we can, we can. You can hear me now? Yes, yes I can very hear well. you. I can't okay. see you, but I can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much for this uh, very instructive um, uh, you know, a uh, talk. Uh, mm -hmm. It was really enlightening and also quite multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And my question is that in this uh, intercultural context, if you like, or yeah. cross-cultural context, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what, and the focus, there is a greater focus on the translator, on his sense of responsibility, but also ethics. And so my question is very pragmatic. What sort of disciplines do you think should be introduced in the curriculum to help the student have the student of translation and we have a, you know a good um, a good bunch of students around mm -hmm. to help them in fact have uh, more insight in the intricacies of uh, uh, this uh, cross-cultural aspect in translation. Yes. What sort of disciplines mm -hmm. would you recommend? Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you, Professor uh, Shella. I before, recommend before you answer, yeah. uh, Juliana, may I uh, ask everyone who would like to ask a question uh, to uh, raise that blue hand when they go to reactions or reaction, and then raise hand. So if you would like to request the floor. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Professor House. Juliana. Okay. Juliana, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, I can recommend to you, and as you said, my, my, my take on translation is interdisciplinary. What I would dissuade you from, obviously, from my talk is to look at the, what I call the, the old, the old uh, <laughs> literature on intercultural communication, which is dangerous and stupid and should be ignored, right? All of these generalizations, cultures are uh, feminine or they are collectivist, etc. All the Asians are definitely that not. What is important is uh, things like um, intercultural pragmatics. There is a volume that comes out by um, my friend Daniel Kadar, 
um, in Cambridge University Press. And we are writing a, a book at the moment that will come out at the end of this year, beginning of next year, Cambridge University Press called Cross-Cultural Pragmatics. Gives you all the way to analyze literature review, etc. That 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 I can cross cultural pragmatics actually goes back to the the 70s or 80s uh, where I was also active in this. That I can very very strongly recommend. And then the book by in intercultural communication by Ingrid Piller, uh, a very very a very serious uh, researcher. Ingrid Piller and Jan Blomat also wrote on discourse analysis. That's an is not Blomert, I think I mentioned him um, as well. And definitely not, not only not this, the, the old um, view of intercultural, but definitely not a psychology. I'm sorry, this doesn't bring us, you know, the, 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 this psychological, uh, uh, the psychological feelings of, of a translator. I don't think this gets us uh, anywhere. I would strongly, more, more strongly recommend Things like linguistics, it's very important that the translator is able to analyze both uh, the texts in his or her native language and in the language out of which he or she is translating. So right. it's linguistics, pragmatics, analysis, and intercultural communication. And not say sociology, Helen Spencer Oti is also a big name. in intercultural communication and Daniel Kadam coming out this year in Cambridge University Press called um, Intercultural Communication or something like that. Good. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much. And of course uh, and of course literature on translation, but you know that. I mean yeah. Yes. yeah. That's obvious. Dr. Mohammed Zahud. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Salhi. Thank you, Professor Julian House. And uh, yeah. well my question is about cultural filter. Yes. You talked about this um, in much more details, but I missed that part, unfortunately. Uh, as I'm uh, like um, teaching um, translation courses from English in into Arabic and vice versa, yeah. and from Arabic and Arabic into English. Yes. So, I'll to what extent do we use like um, cultural filter when translating? Um, from English, which is a lingua franca, into Arabic, or uh, do we have to use it the same level when we translate from Arabic into English, for example? Because English um, is a lingua franca, English is widely spoken, um, English culture is well known, but if we are translating from a language that's not widely spoken or a culture that's not um, well known, the languages of minorities, for example, yeah. do we use cultural filter at the same level? Yes. Basically, the notion of cultural filter is based on the fact that each, I mean, this is a bit idealistic, that the, the, the translator should know about the different expect, the expectation norms of the audience, right? Uh, let's say if you translate into Arabic, you really know how your native Arabic speaker expects to read, like the, 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 the example of this scientific text, would they rather have a text that is very personal, very oral, etc. There you, you filter the text according to what you know as a translator, as a native speaker of Arabic, or in your case of, of Maghreb type uh, Arabic with French influence, etc. Now English as a lingua franca is a very tricky case. English as a lingua franca is spoken by, uh, what we're doing is English as a lingua franca, right? But still, it is English. And on the level of linguistics or discourse, there are still norms of how to produce an English text, right? In terms of cohesion, in terms of how we structure it, in terms of how, if, if, if you publish in an English-speaking uh, journal, how you, you do the abstract, maybe different from... I've supervised lots of, uh, uh, in, in, in England, lots of uh, PhD theses from Arabic speakers. They tend to be a little bit different somehow, more verbose or whatever, less structured, rigidly, like the Anglo do it, right? 
And there is this sort of difference. When I emigrated, I, I did all my research in, in Canada, I emigrated to Canada. I had to learn this because I'm German and the Germans also have a different tradition yeah, in terms of how they write, whatever. So this need, basically, this needs to be known for somebody to apply the cultural filter. And with English as a lingua franca, again, it's, just, it's still English. And when we speak, when, when I write in English, I follow the norms of how to do it in English, right? So uh, whatever, they, 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 there's a new discipline, English as a lingua franca, but still it's English language. And it ha also has all the values in the lexis. It has the, the cultural tradition is in, in the language, you see? Uh, so uh, I wouldn't overblow the, the notion of English as a lingua franca. Yeah. Okay, does this Thank answer you. your question in a, in a bit? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, it does. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Zahud. Uh, Sammy, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You, you are our you're the, hacker. The, the hacker. The hacker. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, it's very good. Job. <laughs> Um, I'm Sami Bayad. I, I live in Brussels. Yeah. I work as an interpreter for uh, mainly for the European institutions. Uh, thank you very much for this very, uh, very interesting um, um, mm -hmm. lecture. I, I have two questions. The first question, uh, being myself uh, more of an interpreter than a mm -hmm. translator, mm -hmm. do you consider that all the principles and uh, concepts that you laid down are, are valid for both the translation process, the document translation process, mm -hmm. and interpretation. And I'm talking here only about simultaneous interpretation, or maybe also consecutive interpretation. Um, why do I put this question? It is because um, you said that um, translation is always doubly context-bound, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and you you, you said that there are two types of equivalences, the conceptual mm -hmm. and functional. For, for interpretation, uh, I think that we, we start by the conceptual because we, we extract the concept mm -hmm. then, and we, we give it a clothing, which is the function. Yeah. Uh, but for, for the translation, it's, it might be uh, quite a different uh, process. This is the first question. So is it yeah. valid for both translation and interpretation? And the mm -hmm. second question, Mm -hmm. regards the the effect that a translator or an interpreter aims at when i studied uh, the theory of uh, translation mm -hmm. i remember very well that the first thing that was uh, that that was a striking uh, concept uh, i heard from my professors was that a good translation is a translation that produces exactly or uh, almost the same effect on the recipient than the original because you spoke mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, the original yeah. on the recipient so do you think that it is a humanly uh, possible possible endeavor <laughs> yes the first question uh, basically i would say the translation interpreting you, you can apply the theories to interpreting the, the the major difference as you of course know is there is a big difference in terms of time in other words that makes the interpreting much more difficult also, you pro probably have to have a very high level of knowledge about the two lingua cultures that you immediately, it, it, it's much more automatized what you do, right? What I said about translation being reflective sounds wonderful, but in the actual act, you don't reflect, you exactly. do. You have to act, and, 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 exactly, but you have to do whatever I unpacked in this wonderful theoretical uh, edifice, you have to do this in, a, in the snap of the moment. You have to have it here and do which is okay. right, it, but it, it applies, it applies. And it is actually ideal. It's an ideal theory. You can actually do it, it, it perfectly, like uh, having the same effect that already goes back to NIDA, 1964, etc. famous Bible translator, whatever. Whether the effect is the same, literally, actually, in the end, we don't know. In linguistics or pragmatics, there's a distinction between the locution, meaning the words or whatever you say, the illocution, that's a speech act, you know, as a request, apology, etc. And then there's something called the, 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 the effect on somebody, which, which we cannot judge. That's a different discipline. There's a difference uh, of, of, of the performance.
death, whatever. It seems whether he is stupid or ignorant or is asleep or whatever he does, hacking other people's uh, uh, things, etc. You do, do not know. It's an idea. And the idea should be the same effect in what I localization or uh, 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 cause much in, in, in everything in text. I in, see. In text. So we, we tend to agree okay. on this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank You're you. You're very welcome. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, thanks for uh, okay. your help again. Mohammed Salah Isa. So, greetings to all participants, uh, professors, and our honored guests. And as you mentioned earlier, the intercultural transmissions and the travel from one culture yeah. to another. But uh, in the context of globalization, can we actually assume that? The transfer of the text from one culture to another is actually possible. The issues of untranscibility and non-equivalence that is rising. And outside the example of games uh, localization, for instance, Arabs have been using English and French mostly to play, communicate, and even create mm -hmm. games. Since basically the field of gaming and creating games is somehow a privilege for unfortunate developed countries mm -hmm. and I will name uh, one game which is League of Legends that is recently be in translate or localized to Arabic. from Arabic game and uh, suggest equivalence that somehow sound for Ian and a direct result of this globalization and dominance mm -hmm. of the gaming field. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts, if you could kindly share that? Thank you. Yes, I, very good. I mean, in my talk, I also warned against the effects of globalization, by which I meant the impact of the English language. And it's sort of uh, basically colonizing in a bad way other languages and other uh, uh, preferences for. Uh, how things should be. But if, if the translation then uh, ends up not being a good one, that reflects negatively on the competence of the translator, who should take care of the, uh, of the addressees in the foreign culture, that they should actually read the game or whatever the text is uh, if, as they want to, to, uh, to read it as though it were their own, their own product, right? That's the idea of functional equivalence. It should be, it should live in the new culture, okay, and not be dominated by particularly anglophone uh, cultures. And there's a strong reaction against this, uh, probably in your country as well, against this domination. I mean, if, if particularly you, you were a French colony and now all of a sudden English, but, uh, as you know, English is so much more important than, than French nowadays. And German is absolutely totally unimportant. I know this used to be a world language but is is absolutely eclipsed by by english but the translator should make sure that the new product whatever genre whether it's a game or an, an instruction for use in a machine etc etc should be culturally filtered to make the the new reader uh, familiar with it right and should beware against a domination or superimposition of of, of foreign norms yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Let me ask you a question here. You said that German has eclipsed, uh, okay. and that uh, English is victorious in a way. But yeah. uh, now with Brexit, uh, some people argue that G German language will uh, be the first most important uh, language in for the EU. Uh, do you still maintain that idea that ge the German language and Dutch, uh, the Deutsch, sorry, is not going to play any role? Yes, I do. And particularly, I may say this, I don't know what, what, what your feelings about language politics. It's mainly, uh, there is one language in the European Union, apart from English, I and mean, the, the Brits are out, but still English is important. There's one particular language that plays a very big role in Europe, and that's French? French. French. Because, very cleverly, all of the major institutions are in French uh, speaking. Uh, it's in France, it's in Belgium, etc., etc. And the French, unlike the Germans, 
and this has historically, are very proud of their language. They push it through. And this uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen only got the job as the commission president because her French is absolutely fluent. She can speak French like a French person, whatever. Germans are not very proud of their language. Historical roots, Second World War, war crimes, whatever you have, etc., etc. The French are very proud of their language. But excuse Germans me, we have... Not. We have this is what, what, what this is what also sorry what I yes. what we showed in our twelve year research project the French guard their language against outside influence the Germans don't Germans are very happy to speak English even though they could speak German etc it's a it's, this is a question of the attitude and the pride in your heritage right we have a, a stereotype here that the yeah. Ger Germans are really very proud extremely proud of their language. No, it's not true. And, and, and especially the language policy in Germany that, re, that is really encouraging German no. language. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I can de 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 I'm, I'm a, I'm a you are an insider. I'm an insider. <laughs> I've seen it from outside. I've been married to a, a, an English person. This is where, where I get all these names, etc. Yeah. So um, definitely not. There are some people who say, oh, and if they, it has to do also with the language of publication. Remember I mentioned if, um, Funktionale Pragmatik, a yeah. very, very good German strand, where they did this research about the dilated speech situation and the ruptured speech situation. Nobody knows about this because they publish in German. Hmm? They don't. Yeah. And if, if, if you don't publish in English, nobody reads what you say. True. That's, that's it. And this is power, of course. Because the, 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 the English language was everywhere, the, the very cleverly foreign policy. They were all around the world. Well, French a, a little bit as well, but it's in all the colonies. I mean, the, wh why do you still know French and speak French? Because you were colonized. But it's, don't it's you think political that French power. Also, French is also losing ground. Oh, yes. Oh, in yes. Europe but, and elsewhere. But in they, the, world. They, the Germans accept it, at least I think they do. But the, the French, um, you know, very difficult. I, I, I recently reviewed an article about French in, in France startups. A startup about, uh, I don't know, also selling products. Et they have to do this in English if they want to sell abroad to China, whatever. Yeah. And, and they, do it. they do it now. And may I say yes. something? The French Please go ahead. Are very proud, are very proud of the French. They, when you speak to them in English, I remember when I went to France myself, <laughs> and they don't actually respond except in French. They do do not actually, they refuse. I remember once I stopped somebody uh, calling him, excuse me, could you tell me where is the supermarket? And I was shouting. He was the only one in the, in the whole street. <laughs> he did yeah. not actually stop and say anything. Yes. Yeah. But they this are, so yeah. do not actually respond in, in English yeah. at yes. all. I remember this, that holds for the colonies as well. French Canada, Montreal, okay? Yeah. My French is, I, I had nine years of Latin. My French is lousy. I, I don't mind. I studied Spanish as well. Anyway, I spoke English in, 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 in Canada, you know, bilingual. They didn't answer. Also. It was the wow. petrol station. They didn't wow. answer. And then I said, I'm German. I'm not American or English, whatever. Can you please answer? Can I? Sammy, please. Yeah, I'd like to... The attitude, to the attitude to, uh, that they have vis-a-vis -vis their language, the pride they have, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I would like just to complete um, uh, the, the answer regarding yeah. the, um, the importance of languages in uh, the European Commission, being myself an insider yeah, 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 for, yeah. for them. Oh, French is much more important. I work, I work in the French booth, and uh, we have every six months statistics on the use of languages within yeah. uh, the European Commission. Mm. Uh, the, there is a, a top three language uh, regime that is always used which is uh, French, German, and English. Okay. Um, German is one uh, amongst those three, and French, of course. So when we uh, consider the number of interpreters and days uh, or interpreter days that are recruited by the European Commission, mm -hmm. you will see that every semester, uh, English will be always number one, even if the English interpreters themselves in the booth work less because 75 to 80 percent of the proceedings of a meeting mm -hmm. happen in English. So they, they, they remain silent in the booth. They only work when there is another language that mm -hmm. is spoken on the, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, so you will see that every six months, uh, 
uh, you have something like uh, 3,600 days uh, that were um, necessitating um, English interpreters. Mm -hmm. And French or German come always in second position, and it's something like 3,300. So there is a 10% differential between English and French and German in terms yeah, of yeah. Yeah, yeah. interpreters' days, uh, or day interpreters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that German is still in the top three languages of the European Commission, Mm. But isn't French more important? Why do I think this? I mean, I don't know. You know, no, much it, it is. It is a couple. So, uh, as an interpreter, mm -hmm. if you want to work uh, mm -hmm. more and more, or to have a better chance to be recruited, you must have German amongst your passive languages. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a couple. It goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Uh, I think it's because German is uh, very difficult. First, second, because. Uh, not all interpreters, because the works in the European yeah. institutions depends heavily on interpreters, not translators. Yeah, because yeah. translators, they work for all language combinations and they translate Absolutely. all documents. So uh, it's because uh, few interpreters have German in their passive language, in their passive combination. So there, when you have a French interpreter or a, uh, an English interpreter with uh, English in the, mm -hmm. in the passive combination, he will translate into French or into English. And then the other languages like, I don't know, like Italian, like, no, maybe not Italian because there are many Italians having German yeah, yeah. combination, but like uh, Romanian or like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Czech, who will not have English and uh, uh, German and they will speak in relay mode or they will translate yeah, in relay mode from the English and from the French. That's why. Okay. Okay. Uh, so not from German. So not from German directly. Not from yeah, German yeah, directly. Yeah, no. it, yeah. But they it, more it, have it, French it, or English. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. why. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So um, I think German will remain a, a very, very uh, one of the top uh, important languages uh, in the European Union. And there has been a very interesting discussion recently in the context of the Brexit uh, about the use of English within the European institutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you, you, you might know... No, I don't that, know. And actually, I don't... Yeah, yeah but this is very interesting. Yeah. Every country at the moment of, uh, of accession has to choose the language they want. So the only country uh, that chose English as a working language was the United Kingdom. Uh, Ireland chose Gaelic. Oh, interesting. And, yeah, <laughs> they, didn't they didn't choose English. And uh, Malta chose English until the very last moment. So 15 days before their accession in 2004, they switched and they said, no, 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 we would like to choose Maltese. And we'll Very good. It was very interesting because <laughs> yeah. uh, it gave me work. I speak Maltese. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, it means that at the moment of Brexit, Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the, um, the, the Treaty of, uh, of Lisbon, yeah. legally speaking, the European Union shouldn't have uh, carried on using English because there is no legal ground to, uh, to continue using English in their proceedings because there is no member no country who has absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But, but because of the constitution of the language combinations of the interpreters mm -hmm. who, for the majority, uh, have English as the lingua franca for relay, English had to stay. Absolutely. Uh, no, but it was, it was so established already because of this relay notion. Exactly. It was exactly. too late. It's yeah. too late. It stays. It's it stays. too late now. And it's so, also, I mean, if you look outside the European... Uh, thing i mean english around the world is just i mean yeah it will have to stay it will remain the the lingua franca and the relay yes. language between cultures absolutely yeah. and it's i mean if you go outside you i've been to china a lot i've given lots and lots of talks in in china and i'm affiliated with you it's all in english Indeed. And, you know it's there's there's no chance for languages like french or italian or, or, or german it's english Indeed that they want, because it's already for such typologically distant languages like Japanese and Chinese, it's difficult to have one 
Western language, like English, and that's it. Full stop. And there, there's no no variety and no no uh, other. Uh, and there, there is another factor, if I may, if my, if mm -hmm. I may add, which is the very tolerance of the native English speakers. A French speaker or a German speaker, <laughs> when you yes, I know have, what you mean. Yeah, when I you am. have uh, a non-native giving a speech in German with mm -hmm. a lots of declension, uh, declension mistakes mm -hmm. or a lot of French grammar mistakes, you will never give him the floor again because you don't want that your language be ill-treated like be, that. Be, be uh, contaminated is the Contaminated word. and ill-treated. It's an ill-treatment uh, of the language. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's also the pride in the language. That, the yeah, pride yeah, in the yeah, language. Yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. but the, the English, the, the native speakers, they do not care. That yeah. the language being ill-treated. So that's they, why you know why you know and they don't correct and no, they don't you, correct you and they don't you, know, you, you never correct you. Correct you know you. why they, they they know how important they are. It's an, it's like very rich people who are uh, safe in the knowledge that nothing can touch them. Yes, right? but at the same time, maybe uh, it's because English has gained such a, a vast ground uh, with with the 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 Indian uh, using. English at the first yeah, place, and, 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 and all the other the colonies dialects. come on in the United States and India and Malaysia yeah. speak English. Indonesia, Indonesia used to be Dutch, whatever nobody speaks. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 yeah, Australia, the, all around the world, Africa, lots of. And interesting is the situation in Africa, not Northern Africa, but because you're firmly French, as I know. The, the, but the Sub Saharan Africa, yes, there is a true. fight going on. Lots of people who used to be. Uh, French colonies are switching Indeed. over to English. There is Cameroon, a, there Cameroon is a now has two, as you know, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there but is a French May I, go back, yeah. may I go back to something about Arabic language? Yes, do. Um, <laughs> I have one, one student, one student who is actually talking about a variety of Arabic. Um, uh, uh, he's doing research in game uh, games and translation, yeah. translating. Are you still there? Games yes. uh, into yeah. Arabic. And he, he, yeah. He's working on some research on this. And you know what he's done? He's written Arabic. Arabic and has actually been very popular among gamers. I was so surprised to find his his, his data. He came back to me. He says, I, "My apologies. All the questions are not in proper <laughs> Arabic." But um, I said, well, I really don't care, but at least you got the data, which is um, uh, very Im important. Uh, that, uh, you know, I mean, he was writing it in uh, very colloquial, um, even Gulf Arabic. And I, I have, have understood some of the terms okay, there. Okay. But it did work. And, uh, you know, I mean, but uh, of course he was apologizing because it's. Uh, let, let me ask you, and this has nothing to do with translation, a political question. I know this from my, my, uh, my, my son in law is from Tunisia, and my daughter speaks. Tunisian Arabic fluently, whatever, so will my grandchildren once they have them, whatever. And I was shocked when um, Wissam, that's my son-in-law, said that he had his primary school education, he's now, how old is he, 33, primary school education in Sousse, where they lived, in Tunis before, in, 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 in Arabic, and then in secondary, it was completely French. French was the language of instruction. So I yeah. said to him, it must have been a, a, an enormous shock all of a sudden, everything yes. in another language. It's, it's even worse. Good. Especially worse. I mean, it must have been horrible. Can you imagine? And and but think people see this as a positive thing. When he got his uh, uh, secondary school certification and he wanted to study in Germany, he was immediately accepted because it has this. Bac what is it called? Baccalauréat or whatever? Baccalauréat. Yes. It, 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 was a, it was a French exam and the Germans immediately said, aha, it's French, they accepted it. So he, he actually profited from this. Yeah. That, that he was, although he had to learn German from scratch, the poor guy, when he came to Germany, obviously. Right. True. We have an Arabization <laughs> policy that uh, really? started in the 80s. Yeah. And uh, before all of the uh, subjects in education, whether they are in arts and the humanities or uh, scientific and technical yeah. were in French. And yes. now with the Arabization policy, uh, 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 the humanities started to be translated into Arabic and to be... Yeah, but in the universities, in what about schools? 
Yes, even school, even schools, secondary schools, ah. schools basically. And now, uh, still, the uh, scientific subjects are being taught ah. in French. Even the ministries ah. now, you can see the ministries that have very uh, direct contact with the citizens, the lay, mm. pers uh, lay citizens, they are Arabized, mm. like the Ministry of the Interior, Ministry of Sh Social Affairs, Ministry of Justice, yeah. the, the, the main language, working mm -hmm. language is Arabic, mm -hmm. but other ministries oh. like the industry or technology or all of the papers, most of them are produced in, in French. They are still uh, using French as the uh, primary language. Yeah, I can see uh, Professor mm -hmm. Mohammed Jaber. You have the floor, Professor. I guess. No. Good afternoon. Yes, I can't see you, but I can see Hi, your name. Can see my name on the screen. Yes. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, no, I can Professor. see. You. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Now, I just wanted to uh, comment on the issue of uh, cultural yeah. relativism, which you referred to at the beginning mm -hmm. of your presentation. I noticed that you were too dismissive at some point. You uh, rejected uh, um, cultural re relativism, um, and um, I understand that because a lot of uh, research in uh, cult on cultural relativism led to the development of some mm. stereotypes about yes. other cultures. I totally take yes. your point, but having said that, we should not completely dismiss um, uh, cultural relativism as an irrelevant field of investigation because it can be very useful at some point. Yes. Uh, and it can be useful in specific situations and contexts. I myself was involved uh, in uh, research on business negotiations between uh, Tunisian businessmen and Danish mm -hmm. businessmen mm -hmm. at some mm -hmm. point. Uh, and I, I was involved in a research uh, project with the uh, uh, Danish, uh, the Copenhagen School of Business. Yeah. And we found at that time that Tunisians mm -hmm. and Danish businessmen did not have the same negotiating strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, the Danes tended to focus a lot on details. Tunisian negotiators thought that was a, a case of mistrust on the Danish part. And, you know, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and, and I, that I, led to yeah. a, gra a great deal of misunderstanding. Also, yeah. I supervised research in, uh, in a t Tunisian travel agency, a British Tunisian travel agency, where we found that greetings um, were actually one of the sources of misunderstanding between Tunisian and British uh, employees in this particular um, travel agency. So I agree with you that some information uh, produced by cultural relativism can be used to uh, promote certain stereotypes about other cultures. But yes. we must not uh, neglect the fact that there are cultural differences. Uh, and uh, these differences can be a source of misunderstanding and miscommunication between cultures. Very the more good. we know about other cultures, yes. in my view, the Absolutely. better we can communicate. <laughs> yes. So yes. probably because you referred on, uh, you know, you used a lot of the term rubbish when you referred <laughs> on to cultural <laughs> communication, you know, and the cultural <laughs> I thought maybe we need to, yes. yeah, we needed to bring more perspective yes, on but that. But what I, um, so that's my first, yeah. okay. my first comment. Yes. I, my second comment is about, um, is about uh, the cultural filter which you referred yes. to, and uh, particularly the question of, uh, 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 and also the question of functional equivalence. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a big issue for interpreters. Uh, probably you can handle this more easily in the case of written translation. But suppose you are an interpreter in an English booth, translating uh, an Arab speaker mm -hmm. uh, from Arabic into English. Yes. And you know that in Arabic discourse, we have uh, uh, a specific rhetorical uh, strategy, which is repetition. I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in negotiating, Arabs to convince others sometimes resort to mm -hmm. repetition, mm -hmm. what may be perceived as redundancy by an English speaker or an English listener. Mm -hmm. um, for an interpreter, it's a, it's a big issue because the speaker keeps repeating the same thing. What do you do? You do it as well. You do it there, repeating the same thing. But you know that your English speakers will be fed up with this because it's not, it's not accepted as a rhetorical uh, strategy. Exactly. Uh, you have, and, and then we are, we are stuck with time. What do we do? Should we then wait, keep quiet? And if we keep quiet, we have a problem yeah. there? 
uh, you, should we should we keep talking? I need to accept it. I know. <laughs> Interpreting the same idea in different yeah, ways. Yes, yes. So Absolutely. That is an issue. That is an issue that we have. And we have also the question of uh, the um, overuse of synonyms in Arabic, which is not Absolutely. accepted in English. So what do we do? We have a speaker who is speaking and then the interpreter is quiet and then the people will start looking at you. What, you know. Uh, so mm. this is... Mm. The question of uh, uh, equivalence and rhetorical equivalence is, is really a thorny issue and we have to be extremely mm -hmm. uh, careful with it. Um, I think it also in translation it applies because mm -hmm. I remember um, uh, translating texts from Arabic into English and my uh, clients, my Arab clients are not happy because, uh, you know, they give you a five page document and you give them back one page and a half and they keep saying oh what happened to the rest of the Absolutely. document Absolutely. <laughs> yes <laughs> so they, uh, there is an, a, a big issue there and uh, mm -hmm. you want to keep your customers satisfied and you need to explain to them uh, your, your job but sometimes people don't understand this uh, this question of uh, um, functional equivalence and uh, rhetorical yes. Equivalence. yes so those thank are my two comments professor. thank yes. you very but, much uh, professor Jebel, for these very good uh, questions can i can i say something yes, please to the, to yeah, yeah. So the, your first comment is, of course, uh, perfect. I, I have to uh, admit, however, what I was basically uh, uh, raving against was the wild overgeneralizations of the type Hofstede. There are collectivist cultures, and I think this is putting down whatever. That's very bad. What I totally agree with when you mentioned the Tunisian versus Danish, whatever, I myself, my, my whole contrastive discourse analysis did exactly the same. And I came up with, but the difference is that you have to do a little bit of research. You already mentioned it. When you, let's say, you have a, a whole arsenal of, of experience translating Danish into Tunisian Arabic or Tunisian Arabic into Danish, then you know that the texts are different, that people expect different things. This is your, the, but this is empirical. That you need empirical research to say there, these are the difference and there are rhetorical difference. Just as you said, the repetition, I had lots of uh, people, uh, uh, Arabic speakers who did um, PhD thesis in translation in Britain, etc. So they've actually also always mentioned this, um, uh, the synonyms and the and, uh, and the repetition, and the, the, the structure is different. But these are facts. That's totally different from saying you belong to a collectivist culture. And the Islamic cultures are, are backwards and uh, whatever they are, clumsy or stuff. Something. This, this, is what I, this is what I'm getting at, right? Not the, not the, not the fine-grained rhetorical, and there are differences. Obviously, I am the least one to say, because I'm German and I operate in English. I was married to a foreigner. My daughter is now married to somebody from Tunisia, as I told her. She knows that there are cultural differences. In the more you very nicely said what I the more you know about the difference, you take account of them. Either you adapt or you say he's just different, she's just whatever. And this is this is this is the basis for our tolerance in all respects, I would say, right? I agree with you, Professor. <laughs> I agree. I yes. highly agree with you. Thank you very much for the, for your comments and questions. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. I think we are done and we are coming we are coming to the end of this uh, very beautiful and very informative insightful uh, lecture and exchange between the uh, participants with our guest speaker uh, Juliana so uh, I would like to thank you so much for accepting our invitation for being a charming uh, guest today you have hosted us in your kitchen so you brought <laughs> us to uh, to the very personal space and you have told us uh, and, or you discussed the ideas of intercultural communication with uh, personal stories and examples from your own family and how to know mm -hmm. more the difference and to be uh, tolerant uh, thank you very much for, for, for this. I would like also to thank uh, my students and the professors who have attended uh, and uh, have taken part in this uh, discussion. Uh, and I would like to extend my uh, very uh, sincere apologies for the inconvenience, for uh, the hacking, 
but uh, this is a very good uh, call for us to take uh, some precautions because evil uh, uh, guys and bad guys are always there. Uh, they do not, some of them, they do not like knowledge to be disseminated the way, the, the good knowledge, I would say, to be disseminated the way it should be. And here mm -hmm. we are discussing issues pertaining to tolerance, uh, uh, pertaining to dialogue that is needed, pertaining uh, to uh, all the attempts to exclude, disseminate, and expel any sorts of stereotyping or judgments. Uh, we should not have judgmental attitudes and our guest speaker has provided us with uh, very good arguments for uh, being uh, uh, tolerant and she provided the ev evidence not only from her research and what she's writing about the empirical research but from her own family. So I can't thank you enough professor and I think we are going to meet again. I have yes. been very honored to share some publication with her, edited by uh, Juliana. Uh, the yeah. publication, yes, it is the one. Yes, this it is. is Said, uh, my, my good friend Said. Yes. <laughs> and myself and other people. Okay. Yes, uh, translation and uh, aspects, uh, or globalization and aspects of translation. So uh, thank you very much again. And tomorrow we have uh, uh, also another uh, encounter. Uh, as part of this uh, series of uh, encounters at the shores of translation. Thank you very much and goodbye. Uh, do you like to say a final uh, and Thank you, goodbye. thank you very, very much. I, I was very, it was a very good discussion and I enjoyed myself. We could go on for another 10 hours, but you must be sure. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Paul. Thank you, thank you. It was a great pleasure for me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.